Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Forester's Forecast. My guest today is Dr. Laura Ramirez. She is a PhD biometrician at Weyerhaeuser. Uh, we had a great conversation about her life growing up in Colombia, going to university in uh, the National University of Colombia in Medellin, and also about her transition uh, to grad school at the University of Georgia, and then on to you know life as a working biometrician. Uh, it was an excellent podcast. I enjoyed talking with her so much. So uh, please help me welcome Dr. Laura Ramirez. Hey, Laura, welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy to have you. Uh, I have to say that a lot of people have been asking for me to do an interview with you. Uh, and so I'm super excited. Thank you, Miki. Uh, uh, well, that's funny because I thought I would have to wait like 30 years until my <laughs> retirement for you to, to invite me to the podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, the general idea was to interview some of the older biometricians and talk with them. And then since I've been doing that, they are all asking me to interview younger people. So <laughs> I get the two perspectives. That's a good idea. Yeah. Right, exactly. And hopefully along the way, we can find some people in the middle. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. So um, you graduated in May with your PhD from UGA, and you've been working for Weyerhaeuser ever since. So I just want to ask, how's it, how's it been going? It's been going pretty, pretty well, pretty busy, I would say. Yeah. Um, I have to say before getting into the industry, you know, when you when you finish your PhD, everyone is asking you, do you want to go to academia? Do you want to go to the industry? And so I, I knew I wanted to go to the industry, like basically since I started my PhD. Mm -hmm. And but some people were saying, like, okay, you're gonna have like a like the transition is gonna be hard. And at the beginning, I was like, well. Why? I mean, it's not like I've never worked before. It's just like an, another job. I, I know that I've been studying for these almost four years, but I'm just going to start a new job. Like what's, what's, I know, what's the difference? But I know it is, it is a transition because you go from, and when you're doing your PhD, you're pretty much focused on your own project, pretty much just working with your major advisor or your committee. And you're very focused on that single project, at least when you finish your classes, right? right. Uh, but now when you're in the industry, it's more like you now have a really good team to work with. You have to rely on them. They they trust you and you have to do a lot of like work together. And that's the difference. Well, one of the main differences that I found, like first, you're, not, you're working with many more people and second, in many more projects, not right. just a single one. So. I actually felt the difference, but I think I'm getting into into that just just fine. I'm doing I'm doing fine, and, and but I know it's gonna take more time for me to get used to the to everything in the industry. Yeah. But I'm but I'm really I'm really glad I I got into this position. I'm learning just so many things, and this has just expanded like my my vision of biometrics really. Yeah, I completely understand. I mean. Like you said, coming straight out of academia, you have certain kind of expectations about what life will be like. And at least for me, it was completely different. <laughs> and like you said, it's like you go from being like kind of the the main author on your whole work day to no, you're a part of a bigger team and then you're just kind of collaborating and working together mm -hmm. and moving things along. Of course, there are days when you're, you know, kind of working on one project or one thing oh. and you're the one. But uh, at the end, somebody's going to look at that and go like, all right, now let's do this and that and work together and try to come up with a good product. So it's very mm -hmm. interesting. Well, I'm happy yeah, to say that. Um, I'm curious. Uh, how exactly you got into you know forestry in general and forest biometrics and uh you know for our listeners i know that you're from colombia where are you from medellin medellin yes yeah, you're from medellin yeah mm -hmm. and so uh so i have you know my wife is from colombia so i've been to colombia i've traveled all over but i have not yet been to uh, Antioquia or Medellin in general. So, How calm. I know, right? Yeah. I, I need to go. And I was supposed to go this summer and then something happened and I couldn't go. 
So <laughs> we went to Tolima instead. Um, oh, yeah. oh, I wanted to go there, but yeah. So so yeah, that's where where I'm from. So maybe we have listeners in other in other countries. I, I suppose. So Colombia is in South America. It's um, and the city where I live, where I grew up, was is like the second largest city uh, after the capital Bogota. And I basically grew up in the city, so I'm not like a, I, I, I don't have like a rural a background really. I didn't have that much connection with nature before joining like forestry. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in the city, like very much a city person. And then, um, I mean, I knew I, when I went to college that like, you had to decide in advance like which which major you're gonna you're gonna follow. And for me, it was like I was when I was in high school. I was in a school where they really uh, they they let you choose like with what what kind of specialty you want to like you want to take more classes of one class or the other. Mm -hmm. And I chose math, so I was really into math. And for for some time, I, I wanted to take like to my major to be math. But then I, I mean, I was really young and I thought like people that study math only will go uh, teaching in, in high school or something like that. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I thought that was a bad thing. I, I don't think that right now, but I didn't want to do that. So I, I started to look at the classes that you will have to take in that major and then comparing that with other majors like engineering and all of that stuff. And like all the engineering majors were like, attractive to me but I was trying to think like what do I like and it's like yeah well I like to go outside so I guess the, the best fit for me was environmental engineering mm -hmm. so I got into the environmental engineering program actually at first uh, and I did one year of that and it was it was really not what I was expecting I don't know it was because of the program was very new or I just maybe was expecting a different thing. But I did like, like I liked the environment portion of that, but it's just that they were focusing more like on air pollution or water pollution or landfills and those kind of things. And for me, it was like, no, I, I want nature, right? So that's when I like look at the other major and well, this forest engineering exists in here. So they have classes like hydrology or physiology and ecology and that was like attracted to me too so i then switched majors to the forest engineering program uh, mm -hmm. like on my second year and and that's how i got into forestry really just because like i was kind of trying things until i got there mm -hmm. and i don't know i stayed there and actually the first year that i did on the in the other program on the environmental engineering program was pretty good because since they had like a more um, like a numerical background, I, I still got the chance to take those classes that weren't necessary for forestry, mm. but I took them anyway. So that really helped me like later in my life, although I didn't know that was going to happen yet. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, exciting. And you went to the National University of Columbia, yes. and it's my understanding that to get into the National University of Columbia, you take a test and it's very, very hard to get in. Like there are very few yeah. people uh, selected who actually take the exam to get in. Is that correct? Yeah, it's pretty competitive and it depends on the major you choose. Yeah. Like for example, civil engineering is very competitive. And actually like that was when I got into forestry, I started realizing that people who got into forestry, most people that was like their second choice. Oh. Their first choice was always environmental engineering or something different, but you always get a second choice. And if you didn't get like enough at the score for getting into your first choice, you get to the second. So it was funny to see like, like I would say, I don't know, 60% of the people well, back then was just the second choice and they all wanted to switch to environmental engineering. And I was doing the opposite. And so you, that was kind of strange, but yeah, it's pretty competitive. And the fact that you have to choose before, I mean, you have to make the decision, which major do you want to get before doing the exam? So that's kind of one difference that I found. I, I understand in some universities here, you, you got the chance to just do the basic classes and then you choose a major, right? Right. 
But so that's a little different. Now I would would have liked to have that to explore more. Yeah. <laughs> you can do both. So we have the okay. you know, go through your basic classes and then choose a major, or you can start from the beginning with you. Oh, want. okay. Now that's in, good. Yeah, in my experience in forestry though, missing those first couple of years to take like the um, basic introduction forestry classes and okay. having to catch up later can be a very complicated. At least at um, where I went to uh, undergrad at Stephen F. Austin in Nacogdoches, Texas, um, the all of the classes had labs, and every lab mm -hmm. was three hours. So, if you started later, you know maybe in your third year with your major, then you were taking like five labs a week. So every day you had a three-hour lab, and that can be you know, very time-consuming and you know very hard to catch up. Um, yeah, in our case, I, I, I know what you're saying. Like, we also started like seeing forestry classes from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it's it's actually like a five year program. Yeah. So it's, it's a long program. So I think that's one of the advantages we have uh, like in the national university in that regard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is the forestry program in the National University in Medellin, is that the only forestry program in the country or are there others? No, is the, so that's where that university has that major. So mm -hmm. they, like the main campus of that university is in Bogota, but they don't offer the right. forest engineering program in there. Yeah. But there are a, a other like five or six universities that offer also like forestry or forest engineering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just I actually just, just went uh, like a couple of weeks ago, I was in a forestry congress, like a student forestry congress in Colombia. It was in another department in Santander, where they have like um, another program in there. And I would say they are, they are different. Like the focus that they, they, they have on each one of the universities is different. Mm -hmm. And... But I don't know, I really never consider other, other universities. It, it was like... That was where I was living, and and it is not that common to go to a different town or city for university in Colombia, unless you are like from a very remote town, and then you have to go to the major cities. Right. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, because culture-wise, it's a lot different there than it is here in the U.S. Generally, you'll stay living with your parents and go to university, you know, close by. And like you said, if you live outside of the city, then you usually have, you either have to travel or then you have to find a place to live, right? Yeah, but those were the, the uh, scars. I mean, those were just a few cases. Right. Most people just live in the city. Yeah. So yeah, I was just living with, with my parents and my sister and my brother. Yeah. And it was a very different experience. Yeah. Well, uh, I saw you were, of course, doing awesome. You got a uh, also a scholarship that only the top 15 students in each program got. Yeah. So that's really amazing too. And you enjoyed your, your time there because then you went and did a master's as well on the same university. Yes, I have to say that I did enjoy my time. Mm -hmm. uh, it was so, so like many subjects that you have to go through and they're just so different, like yeah. entomology and then ecology and then maybe and some for his inventory, so they were like like so many inter interesting things. And I think that the part that I liked the most was getting to understand nature through numbers or through some quantitative analysis. And, and but I also have to say that um, initially when I started like uh, taking, for example, dendrology, that was kind of the, the hardest for me because I, I really couldn't get uh, like enough memory to get the, the names of the trees. And at some point I was thinking like, well, I, I don't know, I, I cannot recognize this many trees. Maybe forestry is not for me. Like, like what, what do I do now? But then I got into kind of the financial portion of of forestry, like trying to analyze uh, like forest plantations, like as a business or as an as really as an industry, and and I found my I found my way again. Like okay, if I if I don't know all the all the names of the trees, that's okay. I know I can 
at least do this. And I know there will be people that is good for the, those other things. Like everyone has like their own, their own thing. And that was the thing that I liked for me. And that's why uh, I decided to go for, for the, for the masters, but it was also related to this scholarship because they, that was a scholarship that they gave me for doing the masters, mm -hmm. which is not that common. We don't have that many like teaching assistant opportunities as I see here in the US. Mm -hmm. So you really have to get the, those like other funding for your master. Uh, many people also decide to pay themselves like uh, even by working at the same time or may, maybe getting like a loan or something. Uh, but the condition for that scholarship was that you have to, you have to take it, that like you have one year to take it. Mm -hmm. it you, you cannot like wait too much for before taking it. And I was a little hesitant about it. Like, oh, uh, like I, I didn't thought about it before graduating. I thought like, like very simple, like you just go to university, you graduate, then you get a job, maybe a house, and, and maybe that's it. And I, I really never like thought about like keeping studying for, for that long. And, but since that was a condition, I actually just waited for six months and then got into the program for the master's and just took the opportunity that was given to me. Yeah, yeah, that's exciting. I also didn't plan on uh, getting a master's. I was just finishing up and my uh, master's advisor was like, hey, you know, I have some money if you want to study. And I was like, oh, yes, I'm fun. <laughs> was that right after you graduated? Too? Yeah. I um, So I worked for my master's advisor as an undergrad. So he had his uh, long-term research uh, experiments and I would go work for him in the summers to make money and also to get experience. But I did that every summer in my undergrad. And so at the end, he was like, yeah, well, you're a good worker. You're interested in biometrics. Would you think about doing this? I'm like, yeah, that sounds fun. <laughs> and then, yeah, here I am. But you also did it on the same university with, where yeah. you did your undergrad. Yeah. I have to say, if it wasn't for my master's advisor, Dean Coble, encouraging me to do forest biometrics that I in no way would have ever got into it. Um, yeah, you sometimes need some convincing. Right, exactly. Like, it's like some people, it's like they sometimes see something in you that you somehow don't see yourself. Yeah. I know I have some people that have told me those things and have led me to this path, I will say. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's that guidance that you get from people that can see something in you that really helps. And it's Hopefully we can pass that forward too, that if we see somebody that shows promise, we can help encourage them as well. Yeah, the, that's very inspiring. And yeah. sometimes I, I try to get people like, come here, come here and go yeah. and do you like biometrics? I know, or maybe maybe you don't know what biometrics is, but I know you like uh, quantitative stuff, or right. I know you're good at, the, or, at this, or you will be, but but it's sometimes hard to convince people to get into this. Yeah, it is. And it's interesting because there are so many jobs available right now in quantitative forestry. We are needing so many people in the field and there are just very few. Um, so for somebody that maybe is interested in, oh, I'm like forestry, but I want to come to the U.S. and work, I think quantitative okay. forestry is a very good place to be. And, you know, across the board, as long as you understand numbers, uh, you can do biometrics, remote sensing, all of these jobs. And I think it would be quite easy to get, you know, a position, whether at a, at a university and a, as a grad student or as a, you know, full-time employee with a company. Yeah, I mean, should be pretty attractive, right? Right. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. And um, even also for people that decides to go for maybe data analysis uh, careers. Mm -hmm. Some people just started to find like, well, I do like working with data, but I don't like like banking or right. uh, like pharmacy data. So I just want to, well, some something real that you can to touch. And I think this is just the, the right combination of data and, and real, real impact. Right. So tell me, you then went from your master's 
in uh, Columbia and you went to work on your PhD at the University of Georgia. So can you tell me how you made that transition? Yeah, so it, it was also unexpected, as I said, I like, right. I only got as far as my undergrad really at the beginning. But then I started like uh, knowing the people that were uh, going to the U.S. for either masters or PhDs. And once when I was I was uh, here in the U.S. for a few days, and I visited um, a friend that was doing his PhD at the University of Georgia, and that's where I met also the one who would be my major advisor in my PhD. That was uh, Christian Montes, mm -hmm. and then. And I was there for a few days and they were showing me everything that they were doing. Like they were doing like a lot of quantitative stuff. And I really like the group. Uh, they have pretty good, uh, I don't know, they get along like pretty well. They were doing cool stuff. They were doing like art programming. And I also started to see that they were seeing a lot of like production forestry, like seeing the forestry industry more on like, mm, that like for wood products. And in my case, when I was in Colombia, that was something that interested me. I mean, I was interested in that, uh, but I felt like most people, uh, they weren't interested in that. Mm -hmm. They were more like, of course we have another, maybe we have another priorities in the country. So more, most people were interested in ecology or kind of a, a, like, how to preserve the forest, these kind of things that are pretty important in our country. But the industrial part of forestry, I believe like it was a little, like not many people was paying attention to that. So when I was saying like, oh, I like that part of forestry, people were like, well, but we like this, <laughs> not that. So when I got in and when I met like Christian and also Branson Bullock, and all of that, they were pretty excited. And when, that's when I got in contact also with the Plantation Management Research Cooperative, the PMRC. And that was like, that was what they were doing every day. So for me, it was like surprisingly like good that they were a uh, kind of uh, looking at this resource, like how to manage the, manage this resource and everything. And I felt really like I have found my place but the only issue or the only minor thing in there was that I wasn't planning on doing a PhD. Yeah. And I was, already, like, I was finishing my master's and actually at some point I was like, well, I do want to study here and to be here, mm -hmm. but I felt like I got here a little late. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I had done my master's in biometrics, uh, I mean, that would have been enough. Uh, but I don't know. And so I was asking people, like, should I do a second master in in biometrics? And, and Christian was like, well, no, do like a PhD. Like PhD will be better. Like you have everything to to do, like like the PhD. And I was a really, I really thought about this for, for a very long time until once he told me, just start doing like the PhD program. Uh, there are also the there is the option of just a uh, you do like the two years of classes and if you don't like it enough you just get your master's in biometrics, mm -hmm. but if you do like it then you just keep going until you get your PhD. Mm -hmm. So that's I think that's the way that he convinced me to <laughs> to come to UGA. That's yeah. how I ended up doing the PhD later once I finished my master's in Colombia. And I actually went once I started, like I never thought about just doing the master's. I was well, I'm here. I just yeah. like it in here. I really like it. I enjoy it. And, and it was, I was also scared because, you know, the reason I didn't want to do a PhD was because you just listen to stories, like scary mm -hmm. stories. Like PhD is like a lot of people depressed when doing PhD. Mm -hmm. Or or in Colombia also, I don't think they value that much the PhDs, they're like, well, you, you couldn't find any other job and that's why you went to academia. Or yeah. it's like, oh, you're just gonna get this job at the university and you don't have any more options. So I have that mentality a little bit in my head, like, I don't know but this is gonna be worth like all the four years doing this and then maybe I'll go back to Colombia and no one will value this or I won't find a good place for me. But in 
anyways, I just decided <laughs> to ignore that and go for for the PhD here. And I feel like it was a very good decision. Yeah. I don't know. And it's interesting. I had similar comments uh, said to me, you know, like, oh, you're just a career student or these kind of things. Oh, what are you going to do? Teach. And it's like um, those comments always come from people who don't have PhDs. And so <laughs> like, <laughs> Once you get there and you start seeing the opportunities that open up to you once you have it and the things that you can do and the places that you can go. It's just so amazing what, you know, life can bring with that extra step. I too didn't want to, I, well, I wasn't planning to do my PhD. Like, yeah, I got talked into doing a master's. It was fun. And then my master's advisor was like, hey, you should really think about doing a PhD. You're good at this. And so I was like, okay. Actually, during that time in the U.S., it was 2008 to 2010, there were like, well, you know, the recession happened, mm -hmm. and there weren't many like forest analyst jobs available during that time. So it actually was a nice step to <laughs> go mm -hmm. to, do the PhD and then to go into work because there weren't a lot of jobs available. Mm -hmm. But yeah. since then it's just been, I mean, all over the world, there's been opportunities. Um, so yeah, and I, and I also like to say whenever I'm being asked about my how, how my PhD experience was, uh, I also like to say that it was, it was really great. Yeah. And it was, uh, I mean, I never had those issues or I know there's ups and downs, but I felt like mm -hmm. um, I really enjoyed. And the main part of that was like, I guess the combination of two things. One, that it was a topic that I really liked mm -hmm. uh, because I mean, when you have to do things, it's like, it's if you're doing something in a topic or in an area that you don't like, that's gonna be very hard to to accomplish. Right. And the second part was well, like the major professor and and I think I work pretty well with Christian. We have a very good relationship. I was able to understand what uh, he wanted me to do. He was very patient and kind of teaching me like lots of new things. And I was just like a sponge, like. And learning and learning and so those two things uh, really helped me to have like a great experience like during the whole program so so i don't know i don't i also cannot recommend like doing it to other people because my experience will be maybe very specific but i, I like to give my testimony that like that like a happy phd is possible <laughs> I don't know if it's something unique about forestry, but I hear similar comments across uh, forestry disciplines that mm -hmm. people generally, and maybe it's because when you are going into forestry and you're going into the specific discipline, you are doing what you want to do. It's not like, you know, my mom wanted me to be a doctor or an engineer or something. So I went that route. It's like, you generally want to do it, but I believe that the people here are generally very good. It's not a toxic environment like it is in other fields. And so if you want to do it, I have a feeling that if you do, you're going to have a good experience for the most part. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it was um, what well, we were really excited to have Christian at the PMRC. We know now he's left and gone to Rainier. Um, of course, we love Bronson as well, but uh, it was really interesting having him there and then hearing about the things that he was doing. So how was working with him? What was he like as an advisor? Uh, he was a really good one. And and I, I'll say all this that I was telling you that, about teaching you new things. Mm -hmm. It's really from the beginning. So uh, one of the things that I liked the most was that I, I was never afraid of asking questions. Mm -hmm. And that really helped me because he will, I mean, if you ask the question once and he answered that, you just go from there. And if you keep the question like forever, then um, I mean, it's going to be harder to ask. Like once you're graduating, like, well, what do you mean by QMD, like, well, it's too late for asking that. <laughs> so that's one of the things that I like about working with him. Like, I could ask anything, like, or even if, if it was something that I asked before, he would always just answer 
like with a smile and just explain to me everything again. So I really like that. Um, and I also, I think he got a, he managed to have a good balance between like pushing me to do new things or explore new things that I've never done before. Mm -hmm. And, but also he will understand whenever I was uh, tired or whenever I was just like in a rabbit hole, he will say like, okay, it, you haven't, I mean, you've been uh, trying to solve this error in your code or this, um, this analysis that is not working. You've been trying to do this for two weeks. It's now time to go and rest. And he yeah. will literally, like, literally tell me, like, go, go to the beach, do something and come back like three or four days later. And so I really appreciate that advice because, well, even though I didn't go to the beach, mm -hmm. but I did, I did like rest and like, okay, I'm going to like step back and rest and go back in a few days. And, and it worked. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember that specific case. And then I cleared it. I just left the, the issue aside for a few days, came back to it. And when I came back, it, like with a fresh uh, mind, I, I solved that and so those kind of things were really helpful like for going through all the process so so yeah that was really 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 good to have yeah and you went from uh medellin to athens which athens is obviously much smaller than medellin so how <laughs> how was it for you making that transition uh, it was hard because so i started on the fall of of 2019, so August in Georgia, mm -hmm. still pretty hot, right? Yeah, right. So I, I couldn't believe, like, because I was pretty much used to like the tropical weather where uh, it's a little, like, kind of chilly in the morning. It's gonna, it, it gets like a little hot at, at noon, and then it's a little chilly again at night, especially in Medellin because you know it's high altitude. Mm -hmm. But it was um, pretty much used to that mild weather, like not not that many changes and when i got here and i remember like my first day going to uga was like well i woke up early and it was like 7 a.m leaving my my place and it was so hot and humid and i couldn't believe that it was that hot at that time in the morning mm -hmm. but it was just my mindset like it doesn't doesn't matter if that it's in the morning like we are in summer still, basically. Right. So that's why it feels so hot. So so the weather was kind of hard to handle at the beginning mm -hmm. with all the swings and then it got cold. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was uh, pretty different. But uh, I mean, I appreciate that. It, it gets a different feeling about like how time passes. Yeah. Because when you live in a tropical area, like every day yeah. looks the same. Basically, you know, you know it's December because you see lights and like trees and like all the decorations for, for December and these kind of things. But there's no like a significant change in the weather, maybe more rain or less rain and that's it. But here you kind of see the year passing, like because you see the seasons, like maybe people that haven't lived in, in places without seasons, they, they don't realize that. Yeah. But I think that's a pretty different aspect of living like, like you know, in the tropics and then in the part where you have seasons so right. that's kind of different and and i'll say also the fact that this is a small town even i know it is not that small like compare for example for where you went to, mm -hmm. to your undergrad because i was in that town the other day yeah. like actually athens is pretty big compared to other towns right yeah um, right. But yeah, I, I still enjoy like all the, I try to go to all of those grad student activities where they give you like pizza for free or ice cream or some, or the coffee hours. Yeah. So I really enjoyed that part of like being in that community and mm -hmm. just enjoying being a grad student while, while it lasted. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. You, um, I saw that you did go to the biennial Southern Civil Culture Conference that was in Nacogdoches. I wasn't able yes. to go to that one, unfortunately. But um, yeah, that's the that's my hometown. That's where I grew up. And it's quite different from your hometown. Yes. <laughs> my my wife goes there. She's like, oh, this is a nice little village. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she's from Bogota. That's like 8 million people. So 
Um, I do cool. like the weather in Colombia though, because I can pretty much know no matter what time of year, I can just wear shorts. So yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, that's true. I only bring an umbrella. Right. And I, I don't have different like uh, clothes for, for different like months of the year. It's just the same. <laughs> They're interesting because if you want to change climate, you just go up or down the mountain. Right. right. <laughs> so, uh, but the fact that the sun, you know, comes up at six every day and goes down at six every night is just like. That's you know. also one of the hardest things because now here <clears throat> I was used to, mm -hmm. I mean, you get to work, for example, when you get to work, it's already you, like there's light. When you go home, it's night. It's, it's kind of the basics, but when it's winter in here, it's hard because I feel like I cannot wake up before the sunset, before right. the sunrise, because it's yeah. just too early. Like my mind is still like you yeah. just you work when there's light, you sleep when it's night. So that time difference is actually yeah. it's a thing. <laughs> it was very hard for us when we went to Norway because of that difference between the summer and the winter. So we lived in Oslo. So in the summer, it was like two hours of no sun i wouldn't really say night it was just kind of kind of dark but not really fully dark and then in the winter it's two hours of sun but it's not really daylight it's just kind of sun comes up and it goes mm -hmm. down and then it's like what you said it's like you want to wake up to the sun but uh -huh. the sun is up at nine and it's not really up and then it's down in two hours and you're like man i just want to sleep all winter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um but yeah, cool. So I, I'm i curious about, so you went to UGA and you started doing your research. And now that you've been working for uh, seven or eight months now, you have a much different idea about biometrics and how it's used here in the US. And so I'm curious how the differences are between the US and Colombia. Well, I didn't get like the chance to work in biometrics in Colombia. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know like the different jobs that my that my friends will get will be more like like trying to comply with environmental rules or something. Like if people is building like a mall, they need a forest engineer that could identify the trees and say if this is an endangered species or not. Oh, okay. Or they will work more uh, for example in compensation plans. If they cut some trees, they have to compensate those trees and plant some others in other regions. Or like there are lots of those kind of consulting jobs that are really like one of the, the bad things, I will say, that I, that it's really sad in the country is that like for forest engineers, most of them sometimes just get like very short contracts. So they don't get like long-term jobs. So it's kind of a lot of a job insecurity yeah. uh, for some people that went to study forestry. And that's a little sad, I, I will say. And because I see here like forestry is, is more, I mean, it's a, like a high proportion of the economy, uh, especially for example, in Georgia. Okay. So people is aware of the importance of forestry and I, I think uh, people that study forestry, they do well and they find jobs easily. So I think that's one of the major differences. Also, well, in Colombia, there are also uh, like just a few companies that will work with a uh, product like managing forests and planting forests. And so, for example, close to Medellin, there's just like one or two companies. And... I would say like is like the competition is 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 higher. You have to, I don't know, maybe work for more years before getting into one of those companies. So I think it's is harder. But here I see there are like more, many more companies. So you have more opportunities to get a job. So that's one of the the biggest differences. And how is the forest industry there? I saw that your one of your uh, well, your master's project was on mm -hmm. modeling. Um, but how do you call that pine? Pinus. Patula. Patula, yeah, patula pine. So is that like a? I, that's a. Uh, it's native to Mexico, so it's not native to Colombia. So mm -hmm. 
is that a major tree species or you were just yeah. doing some um, analysis that's, to see if it would work there? So that's one of the major species that, that pine and also some eucalyptus right. uh, that are planted. But uh, like my understanding is like forest plantations in the country in Colombia, they have been, they haven't been growing that much. It's like like that was one of the objectives of my of my masters. Like there are, there had been other studies kind of identifying areas for planting new, like for expanding the industry, for planting, like getting new stands or new properties for planting. Mm -hmm. uh, but for some reason, kind of the the area that is planted hasn't like grown that much. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's an expanding industry. Uh, and I believe there are many challenges associated with that. So in my analysis, what I was trying to get is like, those areas have been identified as potential areas to be planted because they had like good um, soils or good properties, but, and they weren't like uh, located in like uh, preserved areas or something like that. So those were like uh, good areas, but but we didn't know anything about the profitability of those areas. Right. Like, well, maybe this area looks good, but it's like 200 kilometers from the closest mill. Mm. So we didn't know that. So one of the things that I did, uh, that was uh, kind of mapping that out, like trying to get, okay, like what kind of mills do we have and how far are these properties that we are identifying as potential areas? Is that close enough? How much is going to be the hauling cost, like the transportation cost for the potential the logs that are going to be getting out of there? And I found that like transportation cost was like one of the major kind of uh, challenges that we had in there because you know, especially in Antioquia where the analysis was done because it's a lot of mountains mm -hmm. there, so uh, we don't have like mm, like like good ways to go from one point to the other that are fast and efficient and like cost efficient. So it basically, if you're not close enough to the meal, it's not profitable for you to plant those trees. So like the, the that in kind of infrastructure, I think is missing in Colombia. So I believe if we want to have like a stronger like a, a industry, like forest industry in Colombia, it will have to be aligned with other sectors in the country, like for the street itself, it's going to be hard because we need a lot of support from other parts of other industries. Yeah, that's and so the 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 infrastructure being one of the biggest issues there is that the roads tend to be small mm -hmm. and sometimes not very well kept. Um, and because you're in a, a mountainous country, uh, it can be difficult to to move wood um, yes. um but is there opportunity for like new mills or is that something that's very limited well i think there are opportunities uh, potentially for those areas mm -hmm. also antioquia that 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 specific area that i talk about is not the only one we also have other portions of the country that are uh, flat yeah and <laughs> they have very like uh, roads infrastructure uh, we also have the north part of the country where they plant for example teak mm -hmm. which is pretty val valuable and it's also a, a lot about i think we need more research because right now this pine that we were talking about uh, that's an uh, exotic species in the country, right? And basically we've been planting that species because we we know how it behaves in the country. We know where to plant it, how to plant it, and how to manage that. Mm -hmm. But there, are, there aren't that much research on the native species, which might be the more valuable ones. So that was kind of also contrasting here when I saw here that they plant loblolly, which is like, native of here on the US like and they really exploit this resource here because that's where the pine is from but we are in Colombia just kind of getting this pine from other parts from Mexico and uh, the eucalyptus too so maybe if we invest more in uh, research about how to manage those um, native species uh, we will have more opportunities there in the market as well mm -hmm. and yeah that's something that that we're missing. 
Yeah. What kind of native conifers do you have? I know there's one, a just one pine that is like the Colombian pine. Yeah. And that I know that's the only pine that is native in Colombia. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I told you before, I'm not, my dendrology is not my expertise. I couldn't, couldn't talk much about the other conifers that we have. I know we have, but I think that's a introduce another cypress. And that's another species. I don't know if you know it. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. <laughs> no, I, so I've been to like the botanical gardens in Bogota and I've seen okay a lot of the species but i also went through going like well they mislabeled that one and that one's not correct like that's oh, wow. not a red oak you know uh -huh. I, I would also say that i'm not an expert in dendrology <laughs> either, but i know what is a red oak and what is not a red oak uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah. but yeah i and again i haven't been able to travel as much and actually talk to people involved in forestry so most of the people i talk to well i, I you know, I, I've talked to like you and the other okay. uh, Colombians that have went to UGA, okay. and um, yeah, and that's about it. So <laughs> I was really excited to go to Medellin and actually go to your your university and yeah, I was we going have to our board team in there. Uh, Sergio, yeah, I was going to mm -hmm. meet with him. I actually oh. tried to do some collaboration with him while I was in Norway. I wanted to bring some of his students to Norway. Uh, but then I left and came. Well, in another life, I could have been there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you were already at UGA when I was okay. trying to do that. Yeah. Um, so can you tell me kind of the things that you've been working on as a biometrician in Weyerhaeuser? Yes, a little bit. You know, uh, when I got in there, they told me uh, from the beginning, like it's gonna take you a while to to understand like everything and and now I see that because you know the scale of things yeah. I never imagined like how big things are like just yeah. uh, having so many acres and it's also like you you believe like when when during my PhD you know I built this growth and yield system for slash um. I mean, I did it myself on my computer using R, mm -hmm. but you don't you don't imagine how how complicated things get when you have to manage that bit of a scale of that so many properties or so many acres. Mm -hmm. So, in my team, uh, I work with within the strategy and technology team. So we try a lot of uh, we we work with production, but at the same time, some some research. So we try a lot to improve our the tools that we currently have. Mm -hmm. So it could be everything, could be from inventory, from proof and yield, from harvest scheduling. So all of those are points that I want to explore because so far I've been focused on proof and yield modeling, mm -hmm. but I haven't, I haven't learn that much about, for example, harvest scheduling mm -hmm. or like other aspects of the industry. So that's that's going to be interesting for me. And I also like that, you know, I have like really work on, I mean, I went before in my PhD for getting the data and this is how the tree grows, right? But I stopped there. And uh, before getting this job, I wasn't aware of that much of okay what happens after well you need to have some tools to kind of estimate what kind of logs you're gonna have mm -hmm. and this is done and then that's gonna feed the other and uh, maybe the financial analysis and that's gonna be on the harvest schedule and all of this is a chain of things right. that i hope i can learn like through the years because it's a lot of things and so far it's been a, like a little more over six months so i still have many things to learn but mm -hmm. i'm really glad that that, uh, that i'm here that, that i'm expanding all of this right yeah now those are exciting things and things that again like you i didn't realize um a, a lot of the chain of events and mm -hmm. you know I, you work for obviously a much larger company than i do uh, mm -hmm. my company we manage about a million acres and for analytics i probably touch you know three four or five million acres every year in any given okay. year i'm not working with like 20 something million acres like you are but um <laughs> 
in, in my job, I have to do all of those things. So <laughs> it was like really intense the first year. It was just like, all right, we got to learn this. And that's mm-hmm. the beautiful thing about having a good PhD program is it teaches you how to learn and how to teach yes. yourself these things. So, uh, well, so like my PhD, for example, was just slash pine in the South. Yeah. And now I get to work with Douglas fir in the West and maybe right. like other species in the West, also some hardwoods and like many species, many models, many tools is just impressive. <laughs> Yeah, I can't imagine because I, I kind of am a systems builder. I, I put, you know, the systems together for all of this uh, growing and harvesting loblolly slash longleaf pine. I work in the southeast, um, but to go to like completely different uh, ecosystems and have to learn those. Uh, and also the modeling is a lot different in the Pacific Northwest and the Northeast, for example, than from down here. So. Um, yeah, then you get even into units. So right, right. We, we like these units, then in the West, we use those units. And it's you have to learn all of that. Right? Yeah. You yeah. need to get familiar with all of those numbers as well. <laughs> so you... Well, that sounds super exciting. Um, how are you? Uh, are you using other uh, software than what you're using? I know you're used to R and Julia are using other kind of software that you hadn't been familiar with. No, uh, I mainly use R. Yeah. So basically R every day, just that I, I'm learning how to use it in different ways now. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's very, it's very beneficial. So in the team that I'm in, we had a lot of, um, so it's a team that is composed by many people. So we have some programmers, we have more statisticians, we have mm-hmm. the biometricians themselves. And you learn a, a lot about them because, you know, you learn how to do something, even it's, if it's just one single language, mm-hmm. you learn how to do it and you keep doing it that way for a long time yeah. until someday you get to run other people's code and you're like, oh, what are you doing here? Well, just filtering this data and like, well, I used another function or, right. or like different way to do it. So even within that same language, you get to learn a lot about how to use it in, in different ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what's interesting about it is there's a thousand ways to do the same thing. And I learned the most about coding from reading other people's code and going like, wow, I never would have done it that way, but yeah. it's so much more efficient than how I would do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, reading, reading other people's code it's a struggle at first. Like the first time you look at other people's code, it's like, why, why do you do it this way? Or you really don't understand it, but after yeah. you run it and really go through it, you you get it. And that that's a good thing. Are you doing anything with machine learning? No, not at the moment. So yeah. sometimes I feel like I, I got late to that party mm-hmm. a little bit. Like I know Christian was working uh, with machine learning f- with other students, mm-hmm. but I didn't get into that. I was more interested on other portions, you know, like my thing was always like the differential equations and right. all of that. Uh, so I'm not doing anything or I didn't get the chance to learn that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I see the opportunity and I would like, I would like to learn about that. And hopefully, yeah, maybe in the future I'll have the chance to do it. Yeah. Same. I'm just curious about it too, because like you, I'm also late to the game. I've done enough, but it's still just evolving so rapidly. Mm-hmm. And I'm just curious how other companies might be using machine learning. Uh, I figured of anybody that Warehouser might have something. So I'm sure you <laughs> do, and you're just not a part of that. But um, maybe, yeah, it's been yeah. just six months, as yeah. I've told you. And yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, myself, I'm, I'm not doing it right now. Maybe yeah. other people. Yeah, it's it's interesting seeing uh, machine learning being in all our, all parts of our field, and you see the papers okay. being published now and. It's like so much machine learning in every little thing. And it's like just curious, you know, some people's thoughts. If it's going to be a fad, is that going to be the future? Or are we just going to drop back to our differential equations? <laughs> well, I don't know. People yeah. like people like 
they like understanding things and sometimes those kind of models are also hard to explain and you know it is also if you are going to implement that for like the whole system that we were talking about from like seedling through like harvesting mm -hmm. I mean, it is just so complicated sometimes to get through that, through all of that at the right. same time. So if you have like a simple model that everyone understands, it might be easier. But of course, I understand like the advantages of using those technologies. It's just that it might take more time just for us to adapt it. Yeah, I, I do like having actual properties built into a differential equation yeah. that you understand you know if you extrapolate what it's going to do and what it looks like and i think that's where machine learning sometimes fails and okay. so having those biologically reasonable responses built into a differential equation for me is very attractive and so i have a feeling we're still going to be using those for a while um, yeah that's a very good when you're learning Right. Learning like how to build your models and how the system works. So mm -hmm. might be just like a first step and then you jump to other things and try it and compare them and see which one is better. Yeah. That. So I'm curious if uh, now you've had a little bit time to think. So whenever you're working in your PhD and you're getting this data from the co-op, and they have all of this data collected and all mm -hmm. of these different measurements available. And then you go and you work and you have inventory data and it's missing all of that extra stuff that you were used to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you have a, you know, a different idea now about, you know, how you can build models and apply models compared to with the data that you had before? Well, I think um, it's more like you have to be more careful and maybe uh, try to understand the data from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Because for me, when I was doing my PhD with this data from the PMRC, I, everything I was trying to do was to get a good model and I will just maybe focus too much on trying new models and new new techniques to try to get like better, better fit statistics maybe. Mm -hmm. But now, I understand that there's a lot of variability and it's maybe uh, more things to consider. So now what I'm learning is like, well, maybe it's not that only that your model is wrong or, or that there are other models that could be uh, perform better. Mm -hmm. Just go, go and look at that point that is looking weird in there. Go to the plot, the specific plot. Where is that coming from? Mm -hmm. So when was that taken? What happened during that year or uh, during the last year? Or what was the dynamics going on in there? So why are the reasons you might be seeing these kind of things in your data? Mm -hmm. So that for me has been very informative because there are real things that happen that might cause uh, like what we call weird things in the data. But mm -hmm. it's just that we don't understand it at first. But if you go and investigate and really try to go back to the basics of, okay, this is how the tree grows and I would expect this, but maybe because of this other reason, this happened. So I find it, that pretty interesting and pretty like some something new that uh, will help me to like get better, mm -hmm. like also during any modeling exercise. Yeah, I was also a, a little bit curious because like, in some of the experimental data, you get things like crown width, you know, oh, yeah. and those things are interesting. And maybe today with like remote sensing and LIDAR, you can start gathering some of those metrics, but a general inventory, mm -hmm. nobody's going to measure crown width. So mm -hmm. it's like whenever you're working with data and you have all the variables, you try to throw everything that you can into the model. And then somebody comes and tells you like, yeah, that's interesting, but we're never going to collect that in the field. It costs too much money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could be a struggle. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, do you have any idea about where we're going? I mean, 
So from uh, an industry standpoint, I think we're a little bit on the verge of some changes. We're starting to see a lot of inventory is now being fully remote sensed. I know where Hauser uses a lot of fully remotely sensed inventory. But do you have an idea about where we might be going as an industry as we're changing from collecting data in the field and on the ground to this kind of kind of big data? Well, uh... I do think that there's still room of room for improvement. Mm -hmm. And I know I often wonder, uh, right now you see some technology that you believe like, how is this possible? Mm -hmm. And this is really new for me. Or you see, even like if we do like a parallel example, like our grandparents will be like, well, they don't really get how a cell phone work or how the internet works. And it's like, I wonder what that thing is going to be for me, mm -hmm. like when I'm older, like what will be the thing that I cannot even imagine right now, but that in the future is going to be very simple and very yeah. just be right there for us. So with with all of that, I do believe that we're going to be leaning more to more technology, more sensors, more uh, maybe machine learning. And but it's, it's, it's going to take a while, but I think we're going we're to get there. And I don't know, that, that's why it's exciting because you don't know what, what's going to be, but I know it'll be something surprising. <laughs> yeah. I like, um, you know, the experiences of Mike Strube, retired mm -hmm. Warehouser biometrician, where he talks about in the beginning of his career that Warehouser didn't even store inventory data. You had this, what he calls the mother function to predict the inventory data. Mm -hmm. and, and now he's talking about having individual, you know, repeat, repeated LIDAR measurements on individual trees and having what he's calling local side index or micro side index on each individual tree. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I keep thinking about how big of a data set is that going to be whenever you have that on 23 million acres. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things that I told you, like, yeah. Penny, it's not like, it's not like, you can do just that in your computer. That's when you have to learn the new things and how to handle the, that data and rely on other people in the company and maybe a single task. Um, well, in my case that I will manage for my PhD is now with the, with the scale of the industry, it's something that now is managed by five or six people. And because it's just so big and you you even have to learn new, new words, new terms for calling things because everything is different. So it's, that's a difference. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to move back a little bit because you just reminded me, how was it? I mean, because when you came to the US, you had done forestry mostly in Spanish. And so was it difficult picking up on the terms and the words? Yes, it was. So that was a, like a good challenge. And because, you know, I've, I've learned English just like in an institute and it was like conversational English. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like forestry related. So sometimes I will just be in class and maybe I'll keep listening a word. Like, it sounds like this, it sounds like this. They keep saying it, they keep saying it, but I don't get what the, that means. And then I'll just go back and Google that and see what, what was the meaning of that or or also that something that helped me was like getting some forestry books in English, of course. And then, then I will understand, oh, okay, so this is what they call this. And also some words, maybe they don't have a direct translation to Spanish. So I'll just learn that this is referring to that, mm -hmm. even though I don't have a word in Spanish for that, but right. I know what they mean. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's still learning every day, <laughs> new words. <laughs> I um I I I'm not really fluent in Spanish, but I speak well enough, and I understand a lot. But um, Hector uh, Restrepo asked me to watch a webinar or something that he was doing, and I was like, "Yeah, sure, I'm good enough." Yeah, I didn't know anything like <laughs> all of the technical terms that you never talk about in everyday life, and it was just yeah. like, "Man, I'm going to have to ask him to explain this to me later because I don't get it." <laughs> That's, that's funny. Yeah. And I also remember in some class, I remember this in a like silviculture class with Dr. Kane, 
Mike Kane. And he was asking something like, do you know what this is? This um, It was like a phenomenon or something that we were trying to explain. And I was like, yes, I know it. I know it. But I just know the word in Spanish. I yeah. don't know the word in English. But he was he was kind enough. He also knows some Spanish. So he just yeah. told me, like, just tell me in Spanish and I will translate. And that was a, kind of a funny story because, yeah, at the beginning, that, that was me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My wife and I have been together for 10 years now. And it's still someday she's like, hey, how do you say this word in English? And, you know, it's <laughs> yeah, a, all the time. A thing, yeah. <laughs> Well, great. I, hey, this has been so much fun. I've really enjoyed having you on the, the podcast. It's been a great conversation. So um, I want to say I appreciate you. And uh, I look very much forward to what you're going to do, you know, in, in your career. Yeah, this was really fun. I hope people enjoy our, our talk here. Sure. And yeah, thank you for having me. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Until next time. <laughs>